we will now move on to a very interesting and significant topic from the former associate director of Go Go government relations of the united states olympic and paralympic uh, committee miss karen irish and uh, world feed reporter and uh, journalist of the EuroLeague and um, Fortnite group, Ms. Uh, Theodora Padele, who both will talk to us on the subject of uh, Paris 2024 and uh, gender equality. Uh, Ms. Iris and Ms. Uh, Padele, over to you now. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here and uh, my uh, my greetings and my welcome to all of the participants in this year's Front Runner uh, conference. Um, I'm honored to participate here as well as to be uh, paired with Ms. Pantelli to discuss this topic this morning. Dora, I'll leave it to you. An honor and a privilege as well to be here and to be uh, with Mrs. Uh, Iris uh, to share this interesting topic and our ideas and experiences um, through our uh, fields. And I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. I hope you have a lot of questions. <laughs> exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. So um, for those who have questions during, I think we welcome those. I think we'd like to make this an interactive uh, participatory discussion. Um, I'll give you a bit of, of my background and then Dora, perhaps you can share a little bit of yours and then we can uh, see if there are specific questions for us and, and then we can talk about um, uh, anything that the audience wants or to discuss um, any questions that they may have. But I think, for the topic, I think it's important for the participants to understand kind of where we come from and, and our experiences in the, the sport industry. Um, so, you know, I was in Washington, D.C. I was the direct the associate director of government relations for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And I worked uh, five Olympic Games and one Pan American Games, uh, um, which is our regional Olympic Games. So my, my perspective is very different from most of the rest of the world, simply because the Olympic Committee in the United States is so differently structured. We are an independent, we are a non-governmental organization, and we receive no money from our federal government. It is all from broadcast revenues, as well as from sponsorship uh, monies, and then also individual donors uh, uh, in the United States who uh, view Olympic and Paralympic sport as important enough to donate their own personal monies to the to the funds so we don't we have some government oversight relative to congressional um, oversight our federal government uh, looks after the olympic and paralympic committee uh, and for a long time they were very focused on on medals so when we look at things like, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, we had an, an enormous US gymnastics uh, scandal. So when you're looking at um, the ideas of gender equality, there, there are issues within the United States that we do not have perfectly here. Um, and so there are many things that we are working to resolve. Um, and my personal experience may be different culturally um, from many of what uh, e e European countries um, and even most of the rest of the world, we also have uh, some of the things that we're looking at relative to gender equality in sports is the United States women's national soccer team is another football team which again, differently structured from men's World Cup and Olympic uh, football is the idea that 
our women's national team is both our World Cup team as well as our Olympic team. And they have uh, filed suit because they are far more successful globally and internationally than our men's team um, to be paid equally. So there are a, a number of issues that um, we deal with here in the United States. Um, and then we can talk about uh, women in the, in the sports industry, not just the athletes, but also our experiences um, in the workforce. Um, and so Dora, I will let you have some time to talk about your experiences and some of the things that you have um, looked at and deal with and have also um, experienced as an athlete um, and now in the professional workforce. Let me fix a little bit my camera because for some reason my, my connection was not good. So I had to reconnect. <laughs> So I, I hope you see me now better. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so uh, as uh, we mentioned before, um, I'm a TV presenter. I'm a sports journalist for Nova Sports Channels. And I'm working with EuroLeague the past four years as a World Feed reporter. Um, I started with, uh, with basketball when I was uh, 14 years old. And I was uh, the first female Greek basketball player in 2005 to receive an NCAA scholarship. Back then was like uh, unreal what was happening, but I think that I opened a door for a lot of girls that wanted to make their dream come true playing basketball overseas because it's hard here in Greece uh, to combine playing sports and have an education because um, uh, our system is not well prepared uh, you know, to facilitate something like this. So a lot of girls and boys have to choose whether to concentrate on being professional athletes or uh, receive an education or even, uh, you know, having another job. Um, after that, coming back uh, from the States, uh, I started working as an educator and then as a journalist. And um, for the past five years, as I mentioned before, I've been doing this job, which is mainly a men's profession here. Uh, I mean, all over the world, but here, especially in Greece, from my experience, uh, what I'm doing, because I'm not just a sport journalist or a TV presenter, uh, I'm a commentator and I'm a game analyst. And this was something that I never expected that I would do. Uh, and people that hire me never expected uh, that I will be able to do it because no other female has done it. So for me, um, on 2019, I was given the opportunity to be the first commentator in EuroLeague, a Greek commentator, female commentator, and the fourth all over Europe to ever uh, done this. So, you know, um, I traveled at the States last year to uh, participate in a um, uh, forum with 48 journalists, female journalists from around the world. And we were talking about Title IX and gender equality and all those things. And I start thinking, I'm not a female sport journalist. I'm a sport journalist. I'm not a female commentator. I'm a commentator. I'm not a female game analyst. I'm a game analyst because I'm doing the same work. I'm doing the same effort, sometimes double effort. And I have the same credentials like my male colleagues. So I don't know why we're still putting titles on female sports, men's sports, female jobs, men's jobs. We don't have to separate those things. And I think that the more we educate that there is no gender boundary when, we t when it comes to professions, uh, I think the more uh, we will excel and we will see more women uh, in those fields that for some reason they think that we do not have what it takes. Let me say it like this, it's simple. You don't have what it takes to be in this field. You need to be tough. You can accept criticism because you're a female or you can have family and do that job. And these are things that I still have to listen to. But uh, at the beginning I was questioning, maybe I don't have what it takes because I'm a girl or maybe I can have family and a career like this, but the more I do this job and the more um, I become better, 
uh, I see that there is no reason for a female not to have the opportunity to make her dreams come true because of a label. No label can stop you from dreaming. So I think um, that is what I have to say from my background. I, I try a lot to, uh, you know, to pass on to other people uh, this idea. I'm still working on it because I have to fight a lot because uh, of stereotypes, but it's something that I think I, I wanna do uh, while I'm, I'm keep on being a professional to also fight uh, for other girls to be on this field. I really, I really want to do this. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with, with Dora. Um, and I, I think one of the, for me personally, the idea that women have to use the word fight at all um, is um, sort of a sad commentary on um, on our position and our role. And Dora and I were were discussing before this week as we were preparing for this. Um, I, I moderator can jump in and maybe give us a, a, a how many men and how many women are in the audience and who have registered for the conference. Um, because I think we, we like to speak to both the men and the women. I think we would like to make sure that the women feel like um, there is a pathway forward, um, but also to get a, a bit of a reality check to say, you are going to have to be twice as good. You are going to have to work twice as hard still. Um, and even in the United States um, where equality has been, gender equality has been a topic of conversation for literally decades. Um, women still make only 78 US cents for every dollar that a, that a man makes. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, it is always going to be, well, I'll say, it, I, I hope it isn't always a struggle um, or always uh, an effort that is so time and energy consuming. I agree with Dora's statement that we would like to be seen as whatever field of the industry that we are in as that title and we happen to be female. Um, and that, um, you know, there is also not just gender equality discussions here in the United States, but, um, diversity and inclusion or diversity and equity are major topics in all areas of um, of the workplace and even just in general life in the United States. And as you likely know, um, it, I, it tends to be that Europe is more, far more well educated about what's going on in, in the United States then the US is educated about what is going on in the rest of the world. So you're probably well aware that we have had a Black Lives Matter um, significant issue this past summer and it continues. We are having a racial um, and ethnic as well as a gender um, reckoning in the United States that impacts all areas of life, um, not just um, the workplace. Um, having said that, where that sort of ties into sports in general is that I think um, there is an effort and a dialogue and a conversation going on that diversity matters in the workplace and that having a diverse kind of um, workplace but also the people at the table um, bring in different perspectives so that everybody benefits and that the work that whatever you are doing, whether it is a marketing team, whether it is a communications team, whether it is government relations, whether it is your analytics team, that the more diverse a population that you bring into that, the better off the decision-making process is. 
And there's also quite a number of studies that say that women in particular who are in leadership positions drive profits. Um, there are the CEOs of women who are in the C-suite, the corporate suite um, in the United States tend to have healthier, more robust um, and significant bottom lines relative to profits. Um, and by its very nature, and Dora and I talked about this too, is that sports is by nature competitive and therefore so is the sports management industry. Um, and so if you can't point to successes um, in terms of driving things forward and making money, um, it's a problem because that is what oftentimes you're measured against. Yeah. And Karen, because you, you talk about numbers before, I collected some stats regarding my profession and uh, the league I'm uh, working in to give uh, people an idea uh, when we talk about gender equality and opportunities that are given to female coaches, trainers, commentators, journalists. Right now in EuroLeague, we have zero head coaches, zero assistant coaches, zero trainers when it comes to females, zero GM, GMs, and uh, four female commentators all time. Uh, myself and another Spanish journalist, we are all the only ones that are, we are still commentate on games. And uh, sadly, I'm the only game analyst in 30 networks right now that are covering EuroLeague. And uh, I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm using, I used the, the word fight before because uh, we really have to fight because we are not given the opportunity, no matter our knowledge and um, our credentials to do it. We have to fight for it. We have to be, to go to whoever is, you know, above us and say, I want to do this, try me. Uh, so every time uh, I meet with younger journalists or with girls that they're interested in getting on the field, not only sport journalism, you know, as coaches, um, uh, as um, um, communication people, they all say, do you think men are not going to let me do what I want to do? Do you think that they're going to forbid me for doing it? I think I might choose something else something that women do will like to do. And, you know, I'm getting mad because I'm saying there is no reason to put a ceiling on the things that we want to do. And uh, we've been raised thinking like this, but we need to change. And in order for us to change, men will have to do their part too. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not only our fight. It's, we both have to fight. Men and women have to fight for women to have more opportunities. Agreed. Um, is the moderator able to engage with the audience and the, and the uh, conference participants and registrants to um, provide any questions that might be asked uh, that we can answer or um, sort of topics that they would like us to, to focus on in the time we have available. Hello, Ms. Padelli. Hello, Ms. Iris. We're very fortunate to have you both here today. Uh, Ms. Iris, I would like to thank you because I know that it's too early there and there is a <laughs> time difference, so I want to do this publicly as well. Uh, Ms. Padelli, I want to thank you for uh, playing this role as a a female role model in the sports industry in Greece in a such uh, pronounced way. Uh, this conversation has been very interesting. I was really inclined to interrupt a few times. Uh, you know, Elisaveta Ahmetai, uh, who introduced you, is a sports management student. She's also an athlete in kickboxing. Uh, too many stereotypes that she's breaking. And she was the fourth in this uh, fruitful dialogue. Uh, myself, I've been, I'm an academic in sports marketing, and I have been a former athlete in volleyball, having lived from the inside of many, let's say, male-dominated industries, uh, what you have been reflecting. Though it's not my role here to reflect, I cannot thank you enough also as a mother, because my daughter will be here today in this shooting, but she cannot during the COVID uh, circumstances. She was like, 
are you going to be four girls talking about sports? So she, <laughs> this was the whoa effect for her. So thank you very much for your speeches so far. We indeed have many questions and I call our attendees to keep uh, asking their questions using uh, the designated spaces in the platform. The first of one, allow me to connect to our platform, has to do with how the 50-50 participation, and allow me also to send this on the chat box so that this could be visible also to our participant. You know that the technical issues are a new reality now. So what I would like to ask is how the 50-50 participation in Paris would actually help society in a formal way to overcome the social barrier. This question probably could be firstly addressed by Ms. Irish. I'm happy to, yes. So it was just this last December that the Paris 2024 uh, uh, Olympic Games Organizing Committee and the International Olympic Committee. And by the way, just as a, as a personal anecdote, um, I am much older than most of the audience, but my first experience with the Olympic Games was the 1976 Montreal Games. I was very young at that time, but I have been an, a fan of the Olympics. And so to be here talking in, with people in Greece in the cradle of the Olympic Games is such an honor and it is it speaks to the historic background of my my interest and my love for the Olympic Games. So I, I preface it with this. The Paris 2024, there has been a move by the International Olympic Committee for several years to move towards gender equality, um, but also to pay attention to, and they don't always get it right, but I do think that they are aiming towards a more equitable society. And the modern Olympic Games were started by five Nobel Peace laureates. And so the effort to leverage a global sport uh, event as a driver for world peace and for enhancements in um, society in general has a long history, at least with the modern Olympic Games. And so it's actually a question that Dora and I discussed a little bit of, is the Olympic Games and the International Olympic Committee the appropriate organization and event to drive social change? And I believe that it is because it is such a global platform. If you consider that the Men's World Cup as a sports event is larger than, has a, has a greater global audience than the even the Summer Olympic Games, which is the larger of the two between the Summer and the, uh, the Winter Games, um, it is still a male-focused event as opposed to the Olympic Games, which has multiple events um, as well as gender participation. And so I think it is um, one of many appropriate events and organizations to drive social change. The other thing that the Olympic Committee has, the International Olympic Committee has focused on, and again, it's, it's not always perfect, but I think aiming for higher ideals, even in the idea of um, not just social change, but environmental impact and lowering the environmental footprint of the Olympic Games, um, I think, and, and focusing a little bit on sustainability is another larger global question that the, that the Olympics, the Olympic Games and the International Olympic Committee can, can help address. So that would be um, I think Paris 2024 is helping move in that direction. And, and you mentioned COVID. Uh, COVID obviously stopped the, the Tokyo 2020 games. That is still a question, but gender equity, 48.8% uh, of the uh, 
the athletes will be women in Tokyo in 2021 this year as well. So I do think that there is a, a move and I do think that women will see more women participating in sport. And as Dora has participated in, at, in Olympic sport and also professional and also in the United States, um, it is going to be natural that women move into sports management roles as well. True. Uh, to add up to what uh, uh, Miss Iris said, this is more appropriate for the 2024, but um, what I have to say as a professional is that, uh, you know, I started basketball because of Dennis Rodman, but I started journalism because of Doris Burke. She's a Hall of Famer journalist. She's a commentator. She is one of the most well-respected females uh, all around the world for her career in uh, sport journalism in the NBA. So the more we uh, have exposure, uh, the better it is and the more girls will, be, will get into the field, uh, even if it's journalism or um, communications or management, uh, the more women they see, the better it is. And as you said before, you use the word role model. Uh, since we have the exposure, everybody who has exposure is a role model in a good or in a bad way. It's up to us to define if we're gonna have negative or positive effect to the people that are following us through social media, through the things we do, through our choices. So for me, um, since I have the exposure through my job, the profession I have chosen to do, uh, I think that the more girls are seeing the initiatives I take or the things I'm doing, if I participate as a journalist of the 2024, the more girls like me are going to be there, the more girls will be in the next Olympics and then Olympics after. So I think the more we promote uh, those things, the better it is for the future. Indeed, uh, Dora, I couldn't agree more, and I don't want to put more pressure on you, but uh, academic research also uh, demonstrates that uh, celebrities are more vicarious role models than friends to children. So they look up to you and imitate, since their uh, identity is not uh, formulated and not stable yet, they look up to role models and celebrities and TV persona. I have one more question uh, here. We have, uh, excuse me for the delay. If gender equality should start from the administrative level and then move to the athletes level or vice versa, could you name an organization in Greece or in the United States that is a positive role model for gender equality, a benchmark as we say in sports management terms? Miss Irish, would you like to Dory, go first? Okay. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, the Women's Sports Foundation is one of many. It's based in New York, um, in the United States, um, and it has been established since the 1980s. Um, and it is an advocate. It is also a grant-making organization that provides uh, stipends actual money grants to female athletes who are training. And so some of the United States Olympic women uh, athletes who are in training and who are trying to qualify for Olympic or Paralympic sport now um, are receiving support. They have a, um, a policy or an advocate that is based in Washington, DC. Um, and so they do both on the policy side, but also real money that is being given to female athletes to support them in their training. So that's just one that I can think of, of, of many. Um, there are a number of what we call um, nonprofit organizations. They are non-governmental organizations. Um, in the United States that are advocates for underserved, underprivileged um, youth that uh, do not have um, as many opportunities or as much money um, that are based, many of these organizations are based in Washington, D.C., so they can influence um, national politics 
um, and um, policies um, to advocate on behalf of girls and women in sport, but also, again, this idea of diversity and inclusion where um, black and brown um, children who may not have all of the opportunities are, they have an advocate for them on, and on their behalf. Um, I did also work for the U.S. Soccer Foundation, which uses the monies that uh, were left over from the surplus of the 1994 Men's World Cup football soccer um, that was hosted in the United States that also grants money and focuses on field building in areas where youth sport is um, difficult because there isn't a lot of money in those communities. So those are, those are two that I can think of. Okay, I'm not going to be uh, so positive <laughs> uh, as Miss Iris was because we we live in a different reality here in Greece and um, um, it hurts to say, but since I've been in both countries, I know the difference uh, when it comes to sports as a basketball player. I know the difference uh, to that. It's a big, it's a huge difference. And I know the difference as a professional now, as a sports journalist, but um I think there's also a challenge for the people that uh, will watch this and uh, the future professionals in that field. Uh, they have a goal if they want to stay here in Greece or whatever they choose to do. Uh, but since we're talking about Greece, they have a goal to find a way to promote um, inclusion and diversity uh, for girls, uh, to promote gender equality in any field. And I think, uh, I'm just gonna share with you some things about my sport, basketball, because uh, I think, you, and women's sports in general. Um, I was talking to Miss Iris the other day, telling her that all women's sports here in Greece are falling under, under the category amateur sports recreational. What does that mean? That means that uh, female uh, athletes are not having equal pay no way with men. Uh, they have limited insurance. Uh, some of them, they don't even have recognized contracts from yeah. FIBA. So mm -hmm. if they're not getting paid, they cannot uh, then go to the Federation to ask for their money. So you understand that uh, we need people to, to have goals to promote this, to, to fight for uh, for gender equality when it comes to sport. Um, the TV exposure is limited when it comes to female sports. Uh, the more the sports that they have uh, uh, exposure on TV is track and field, gymnastics and swimming events because uh, we have both men and women compete on these. And when it comes to soccer, volleyball and basketball, we choose what to, uh, to promote. We promote national championships. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about national teams, yeah. uh, but we uh, barely cover any other competitions. So as you understand, um, there are not a lot of girls that will get into playing professionally because we have, basketball is a professional sport, but it has, you know, the amateur uh, label because it cannot be paid as a professional sport, but uh, you have to, to act as a professional. So I think um, here is your challenge with the things that you are planning to do in the future to, you have a goal to promote this, to promote gender equality in sports here in Greece, because we don't have it. I, I, I'm, I'm trying through my profession right now with the things I'm doing, you know, as a journalist, as a coach, as a former basketball player for the national team, but it's not enough because it comes from the people above me, from the Federation. And since we have zero women uh, on, you know, the Federation as, um, and I'm talking about, you know, the top places. I'm not talking about coaches or uh, people that they can be on the teams. I'm talking about the people that are ma making decisions. And uh, we need to have more women to make decisions. Indeed. Uh very insightful approaches and very different approaches. And Ms. Padelli is indeed reflecting a Greek reality that is, uh, from what I understand and from what I know and from what you both reflect, uh, a little bit more, uh, 
a little bit different in a negative way as compared to the United States. We have uh, more questions. Uh, let me share with you. It's about gender equality and not being something new as a subject. It comes from Active Media Group and Themistopoulos Kavogis. He discusses about Title IX, which aimed to secure sex-based discrimination in any school or other education program that receives federal money since 1972. Uh, but this is the case at South Educational Programs too. How has this changed over the past years? Uh, Ms. Padelli, could we start with you this time? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, Title IX is something that um, we cannot even dream of right now here in Greece. And uh, uh, since I've been, uh, I had my, uh, my experience uh, overseas uh, and I know um, how, how it reflects on society. You know, Title IX, it's not just uh, a decision that was taken to change. It was groundbreaking. It gave the opportunity uh, to girls to have the same opportunities and it created a balance. A balance that you see not on the field, but or, or on the court, you see it on the workplace later, you see it at the family, because the more women are going into sports, uh, the more they become leaders. Yes. And we need female leaders. That is the case. The case is not if I will be a professional basketball player, or if I will be a sport journalist or a commentator. The, the case is that I, uh, I have qualities that I would not have them if I wasn't in this industry, if I wasn't a basketball player, if I was not given the chance to be, to have uh, this training, I, allow me to say, you know, uh, I became a leader because I had this opportunity. If I didn't have this opportunity, I don't know if I would be able to have a career like I do now, to be uh, dynamic, to be, um, to be a leader on what I'm doing. So I think, uh, when it comes to Title IX, and uh, because it's something that um, they did in the U.S. Uh, many years ago, here in Greece, we indeed need something like this. But again, it has to come from the Ministry of Education. Right now, our educational system cannot foster an idea like this. You know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, and even if it's the same, you know, we're Greeks, we know what it takes uh, from the ancient years that uh, sports um, and education is the same thing. Sports is the education itself. So uh, if we don't understand that those things are the same and we keep treating them as separate entities, we're gonna have the same result. We need to start thinking that education and sports are the same thing. They provide the same qualities and indeed we have to keep working uh, you know, combining them and not separating them. Miss Iris, what about you? Well, I do think, so just to say Title IX is, it, it refers to a, an actual law that, that, that actually at the time, 1972, President Nixon um, signed into law. So it provides educational opportunities as well as e equal funding and sports opportunities for girls. Um, and it has driven a number of, of things, but I think to, to Dora's point, sports is competitive, sports requires discipline, so does education. Those things can really go hand in hand. And, and in the United States, again, you do not have to choose between education um, and sport. You can do both, and that has really impacted society, not just the elementary and secondary education levels, but the collegiate levels um, or, or elementary and high school here in the United States and, uh, and college experiences. And, and Dora is a product of that. Um, and, and so am I. Um, I. I was a rower in, in college. So I had opportunities to pursue political science as a subject. I was a rower. Um, and then I blended the two into my career. Um, so I feel very, very fortunate. And those, that education, those leadership opportunities, but that discipline to know what it takes to move forward in a career um, are easily, much more easily blended in the United States. And yet we still have our own, 
our own uh, frustrations and issues. Like I mentioned, the U.S. women's national soccer football team, um, they've had to use the United States court system in order to try to fight for their equal pay or matching the men's. And again, they are more successful than our men's team. So um, there's a lot of work to be done um, where the United States can lead and, and be um, a model is great, but I think globally th there is there is much progress yet to be made. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, to this point, I have to say that I come from an institution, Diri, the American College of Greece, which follows the American, uh, North American uh, rationale here, where we provide scholarship for both for males and female athletes. Therefore, they don't have to. Uh, be in this difficult position and this dilemma that um, most Greek athletes, myself included, have been in the past to follow our studies or our professional or amateur careers. And this is a step forward. Uh, one more question uh, collected from the administrator by the audience. Uh, was it difficult, Miss Irish, for you to be a member in the Olympic Committee? How many women are actually members and how difficult was for you to stay in such a position for such a long time? It's, it's very interesting. I have had more female bosses above me than I have had male bosses. There are more, in, in 2012, the London Olympic Games, just as an example, there were more female athletes than there were male athletes. We have one of the largest delegations to the summer and winter games we had 200 we had a total of 530 female i mean sorry a, a delegation team delegation of 530 athletes 269 of them were women 261 of them were men um, and that is reflected in the olympic committee staff um, there are a, a lot of women and a, a lot of women in the leadership currently the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee has 18 board members. Um, the chairman of the board is a woman. The CEO is a woman. Uh, so there is a significant emphasis on women in sport uh, at, at the Olympic and Paralympic level. Um, and I would say that's true about all of the individual sports as well. Um, there are many women involved in all of the it, at, at USA basketball, at USA rowing, um, and all of the all of the um, other sports, uh, winter and summer. So I have been extremely fortunate um, to work with a lot of women and be led by women who were in leadership positions above me. This is indeed an impressive statistic, not one that I expected. Uh, in, in Greece, I wouldn't say that this is the case. From Ms. Padelli, we have heard what uh, the industry, the sports communication, sports journalism. Have you seen any advancements, Ms. Padelli, though, uh, with your position? Uh, when it comes to my profession, we are very few of us and uh, uh, most of the female journalists, sport journalists, are presenters. So there is a difference being a sports journalist and being a presenter, because you understand that you're in front of the camera, but uh, to be actually on the field, you need to do the dirty job, which people cannot see. You know, watch the games, watch video, uh, create uh, stories, interviews. Um, and um, I think for the past five years, since I started this profession, um, I haven't seen and uh, more females entering the field. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I've seen girls, you know, talking to me saying, you know, I'm thinking, but again, I don't get the opportunity. Uh, they think because we combined, that is uh, the case when it comes uh, on TV, we combined uh, appearance with uh, we miss we're misguided by appearance most of the time because we're talking about tv you know our image is very important but uh you don't have to look good to be good at your job 
And uh, this is something that, you know, because we are guided by stereotypes, we need to avoid. Uh, because when we're talking about sport journalism, it doesn't have to be, you know, like we're talking about TV shows. We are sport journalists. We don't have to look like supermodels or we, ha we don't have to be TV presenters. We're sport journalists. So a lot of girls are misguided by this and they think that in order for them to have this role, they need to be like, you know, like what people they might want to see on TV. But um, I'm trying to tell them, you know, know the game, know the rules, and then you can play better than all the men around you. The more educated you are, the more knowledgeable about your job, there is no way you, you will not get a chance to prove it. If, and if it's writing, in front of the camera, behind of the camera, no matter what you want to do, as long as you are knowledgeable of the subject and you don't just want to go in front of a camera because it's easy to do uh, and you, you want to have a duration in that and a long-term career, uh, the more chances you will have. And I think um, as more as I can to everyone who's asking me, I say, you have to know your, your stuff. You have to, to do the job. You have to work hard. You have to, to write. You have to, to learn. You have to study every day. And as Karen said before, because they're gonna, you're gonna be, they're gonna be doubts. You have to, uh, and the doubts are double when you're a female. I'm sorry to say, but if I make me, if I make a mistake, Twitter will go crazy. Dora said that and that that, and she wasn't prepared for the show. Blah blah blah. But if a guy makes a mistake, it's okay. Nobody will go crazy on Twitter. So I say you always have to be prepared, double the work than anyone else in the room, and you're always going to get your chance. Thank you, Ms. Patelli. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. I could extend this conversation to many other sessions, but it would not be respectful. Ms. Iris, thank you again for going over and beyond the time differences. Uh, we were very fortunate to have you here today. Uh, our audience is very fortunate to have heard such important messages, both female and male participants. Uh, thank you so much for your inspirational and motivational speeches. Uh, we will now close our session and I will attend the message to our attendees uh, who would have to give us a little more time to prepare for our next amazing speech with a well-known moderator and his in-depth knowledge of motorsport, uh, Mr. Punarakis. We will now take a short break. Thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Just remember to have fun. This is a, it is a fun industry. It takes a lot of work, but sports is fun. Okay, thank you as well for having me. It was a privilege to be with Miss uh, Iris as well. And thank you for hosting this event. You're, in a, you're coming from a, a really good institution because uh, I've been in education many years. I know uh, the job you're doing, keep doing this amazing job. We need schools like this here in, uh, in Greece to promote other standards that we're not used to, but we need those standards to excel as society. And to all of you, uh, good luck with uh, everything that you're doing. Uh, you can follow me on social media. If you have any questions, you can send your questions here to the moderator. I will be more than happy to answer them even after this uh, uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you so much.